many of you have learned today, um, today marks the 30th anniversary of Vincent Chin's death. For those of you who watched the documentary Vincent Who or have learned about him, you know that his death led to one of the first pan-Asian American civil rights movements. This was a momentous point for Asian Americans, but unfortunately there are so many Americans, even Asian Americans and young activists who don't know this story. Um, this has become very evident with the xenophobia against Asian Americans over the past few months due to the COVID pandemic. At the same time, protests have been taking place all over the country to show solidarity with the Black Lives Matter movement. There are many parallels and similarities with Vincent Chin, George Floyd, and Breonna Taylor, and with many other Americans of color. So in the middle of the pandemic, we seem to be at a very pivotal point in American history, which is why we wanted to provide the CHSA community with the opportunity to reflect upon Vincent's legacy and what we can do to, um, as a community to be activists. Um, so there was a few questions that we had for participants today before we got started. And the first question is, how many of you guys are students? Um, so you should be able to go and click on the yes, no. So I see. So I see about four or five yeses. Okay, so we have a, a large number of students here. Um, if Serena, if you could clear that out for me, that would be great. Um, how many of you before, you know, joining the program today, how many of you had learned about Vincent Chin in your studies or had learned about Vincent Chin before being asked to join this event? Okay. So we see a, a I see about 10 maybe yeses and, um, three no's, which is actually pretty great to know that maybe in your studies you have learned about Vincent Chin. Um, if we could clear those out quick. Um, how many people remember de uh, the death of Vincent Chin? So I see quite a few yeses. Um, for those of you who remember his death in the Pan-Asian American movement that happened following his death do you think that there has been progress since the death of Vincent Chin in regards to civil civil rights? Okay. See a lot of no's. I see a few yeses. So I think that's one of the things that we want to highlight is like while Vincent Chin, um, he has a tremendous legacy and he led to this huge pan-Asian American civil rights movement. Um, there is still a lot of progress that is to be made. And that's why we wanted to have this conversation we're doing it at a little bit of different event because we're running it off our phone. So thank you for bearing with us during this tech. Um, and thank you. We're lucky to have Curtis Chin to join us today to help us with this program and to discuss more about the legacy of Vincent Chin. Um, so I want to kind of turn it over to Curtis. But before I do, um, I want to tell you a little bit more Kurt about Curtis. So Curtis's documentary, Vincent Who, wonderfully lays out the lack of knowledge regarding Vincent Chin and his legacy. He produced his documentary back in 2009. But it's still a lot of Asian Americans, a lot of young Americans don't know who Vincent Chin is. Um, in addition to producing and writing Vincent Chu, who, Curtis is an award-winning writer and producer and has written for numerous networks, including ABC, the Disney Channel, and more. As a member of the Writers Guild of America, Curtis has won distinguished awards from the National Endowment for the Arts, the New York Foundation for the Arts, and the San Jose Asian American Film Festival. Curtis is also known for his works on the film Tested, which was uh, produced in 2015, and the documentary Our Chinatown, which will be um, released within this year. So I want you all um, to take the time to welcome Curtis, and thank you for joining today's program. And then, uh, Curtis, if you could, I'll have you turn on your video. Uh, to participate in this um, program. Oh, thank you, Curtis. Um, do I continue or? Okay, I guess I, I'm taking over at this point. Um, <laughs> uh, once again, thanks for, uh, you know, um, allowing me this opportunity to um, 
participate in your program that you have set up. Um, it's nice to see some names that I recognize on the screen here and also many new people. So I'm glad that, you know, more people um, are hearing about it, but also people that remember it still uh, recognize the importance of this case in terms of the Asian American community. Uh, I think Maggie wanted me to talk a little bit about how I came to the project, um, Vincent Hu, and then we'll open up the floor to some questions that uh, were sent in by some of her staff and interns, um, and then open up the floor to, to questions. So the basic question is, um, you know, the Vincent Chin case and how I came about it is that, uh, you know, I think if you, if you watch the film, um, I talk a little bit about how, uh, you know, I grew up in Detroit and Vincent was a family friend of ours. Um, my, my grandfather's brother was his uh, best man. So, I mean, it was a very small Chinese American community there and everybody kind of knew each other. Um, you know, I like to think that, you know, my family had a restaurant called Chung's, which was literally the center of New Chinatown physically, but also just a hub where everybody went. My grandfather was the head of On Lang, um, On Lang Hong, the, the Chinese uh, Tong, I guess, or fam merchant association. And so, um, you know, we we're very, very involved with the community. Um, you know, so it's a case that I grew up with as a kid um, in, in, you know, school where uh, people, you know, the whole city was really um, thinking about this, the case, hearing about it, following it intently. And so it really shaped my identity uh, growing up. Um, in terms of making the film, it really came about because of uh, something that was happening in my life personally. I was out in Hollywood, uh, where I am now, uh, writing for television and having, you know, uh, really a really good life. We were very, very, very happy. And then unfortunately, um, my dad uh, was in a car accident back in Detroit and he passed away. And um, I had to, I was the one drafted to go back to Detroit to um, take care of the family business, including selling that family restaurant, one that had been in our family since my great grandfather opened it in 1940, um, selling our family home, taking care of all that stuff. And, you know, Detroit was in a really bad economic state again. And I ended up being back there much longer than I had thought. I ended up being there like close to six months trying to sell our home. Um, and when I was back there, I just, I don't know, maybe having a midlife crisis of what was I doing with my life? There's gotta be something more important than writing bad sitcoms. And that's when I thought back on this case of something that had really um, impacted me growing up and shaped my identity as an Asian American. So um, I decided that I would try my hand at making a documentary. Now I had no experience in it. I'd never gone to film school, um, but I did, I mean, I have a writing degree. And so that was sort of my entry into this. And I felt like, oh, okay, well, let me give it a shot. Uh, and I started, um, you know, asking around, uh, and I finally told my agent, you know, that, that I was working on this book. He was, you know, he's like, why are you wor worrying about this case? Nobody's going to care. But it's a story that I knew, you know, still resonated with me. And I knew that it resonated with lots of other Asian Americans. And I just felt like it was something I was going to do. And again, I just started telling people, oh, I'm going to make this film. And, you know, a really wonderful thing happened, um, you know, is that, so many people came out of the work work to offer their assistance. Um, you know, whether it was the people that we asked to be interviewed to this guy in San Francisco who said, hey, I heard you're making this film. I really want to help you. You know, I'm going to raise all the money for you. And I was like, be my guest. And he actually did. He went out and raised all the money for us. Um, you know, one of the groups said that, uh, you know, donated money. You know, we had a lot of community groups that donated money to the case, uh, to the film. And, um, you know, one of them was the Organization of Chinese Americans, OCA. They gave us some money and, you know, they uh, invited us to um, uh, screen um, a rough cut of it at their student conference that they have every summer. And from that, we had like over 20 schools inviting us to come out to speak. And, you know, literally I found myself traveling to all these different schools and, you know, no longer, you know, being in Hollywood anymore and realizing, wow, there's a real interest in the story. I, I ended up going to over 600 universities and colleges around the world, um, everywhere from Japan to England. I mean, so to Oslo. I mean, so the case is really um, international uh, in terms of its reputation and its importance. And so uh, that's sort of how I came about, you know, to the case and also making the film. Um, 
you know, and, you know, as Maggie said, we finished the film in 2009. So it's been about 11 years now. And uh, while on one hand, it's been, um, you know, heartening that people still use the film. Um, it's also like, a question in my mind is like, you know, are the same issues that we're dealing with now the same that we we did when we first thought of making the film? And so, uh, you know, those are the things I think about. So um, that's basically, uh, you know, my opening remarks about the film. Um, I, I think believe we have some questions that have been submitted already that people can, um, you know, chime in with. Hi, so we were able to get the Wi-Fi back and working. So sorry again about that. Um, we're not quite sure what happened there, but thank you for everyone for being patient and Curtis for taking over. Um, so we do have our first question is from um, CHSA, CHSA intern, Chris. Um, so Chris, if you're able to turn on your microphone and your camera, awesome. Yes. Hi, hey, Chris. Hi, Curtis. Um, thanks for doing this. Um, so my question is that throughout your documentary, you divided it into, I think it's uh, six or seven chapters of, um, to give the trajectory of the story. Uh, my question is, sorry, can you hear me? Yeah, I am. Okay. My husband's um, talking, he's on his own kind of okay. kitchen, so that's what I'm like, okay. If you were to make, uh, you know, make this documentary again today or add on another chapter, what would this chapter be like and uh, what would you want to say with it? Uh, that's a good question, Chris. I actually have thought about that. I actually wondered if, you know, on the 10th anniversary, we might have um, looked at it uh, again. Um, I think that a lot of the issues that we brought up in the film are still very, very relevant. Um, you know, I think moving forward, though, the biggest chapters that have happened since 9-11, obviously, is currently this COVID, you know, uh, crisis in America. And, you know, the president who insists on stoking xenophobia um, and how that's related to just his general anti-Asian, anti-immigrant um, policies. And so I, I think that that would probably be the next chapter in it. Um, I, I do think that, you know, one of the things I've often thought about is like representation of, of the film. And I, I feel like maybe we could have covered more of the Vietnamese American experience, you know, but overall I feel like the film, you know, I mean, no film is perfect, you know, um, but, you know, I, I feel like the film is still holding up pretty well um, in that sense, um, you know. Uh, so yeah, I, I, but if I, we had to add something, it would probably be what we're dealing with right now, which is the COVID crisis and, you know, the rise of anti-Asian sentiment because of that. Are there any legal cases that you think might be relevant to add? Um, legal cases that are relevant. I mean, there've been some other cases that have gone on. Um, maybe we could have gone more in depth, um, you know, with, uh, you know, uh, in Minnesota, there was a Hmong American who was murdered by the police. Um, I think it believes it was Fong La, was that his name? Um, you know, uh, God, there, there, there's so many hate crimes against South Asians. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and you can, you can cover any of them, but in, in some ways, they're all kind of the same in some ways. Um, the dynamics haven't really changed. It's that same old xenophobia. And so maybe that's why the Vincent Chin story is so um, universal and eternal is because a lot of the basic things about that case, you know, are still things that we as Asian Americans still deal with now, right? I mean, yeah. whether it's the confusion of our ethnicities, whether it's, you know, um, seeing us as foreigners or outsiders, whether seeing us, um, you know, as being physically non-threatening, all these, you know, the stereotypes, you know, in that case. And maybe that's why people still think of that because it really, it, it, it ticked off all these boxes of, of um, you know, uh, things that our community and, and we as Asian Americans have been dealing with. But I don't know if there's another one that's been seminal uh, where it's sort of like where everybody's rallied around and everybody thinks like, this is the case that's gonna be the, this is the new Vincent Chin case, you know, as opposed to say like with the African American community, there's always this new thing, you know what I mean? This new big case, you know what I mean? And um, which just grabs your, uh, the imagination of the country. So I, I don't know, I, I, I don't believe there has been one that, that has elevated to that level. 
So thank you for your insight. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you, Chris. Um, our next question comes from uh, another CHSA intern, Felix. Awesome. Hello. Hello, Curtis. Thank you again for taking the time to do this. Um, so my question for you, so I have two questions. Um, my first question is, um, how would you describe the difference between your um, documentary and the other documentary about Vincent Chin, um, Who Killed Vincent Chin? <laughs> That's such a loaded question. Well, well, for one thing, that one's an Oscar-nominated film, so I mean that has it going for it, um, you know. And the other thing is, uh, well, I guess I would say that you know that film, you know, was uh, that film shows you the importance of film, right, to social mm -hmm. activism, which is, which is great. Um, I think there were a couple of reasons why we felt like there was room to make another film, you know, about the Vince Chin case. Um, and the factors were one is that, well, first that film is really hard to get, right? Just because of, um, some of the rights issue and stuff like that. It's not as accessible, right? So that was one reason to make it. A second reason was that, um, I think that so much has happened since that film was made that it was important to sort of see what was, what had happened since that. And the other thing is that film ends really on a depressing note because those guys literally get away with murder. And so from my personality is that I always try to find a silver lining in things and how to move forward. Um, and so for me, making Vincent Hu is finally the one positive thing that came out of this case, which was the formation of an Asian American movement, right? Um, and so I felt like that's what I wanted us, you know, to remember, to have this positive takeaway out of this death, right? Because it's such a sad case and there's no justice in it whatsoever. And we have to be able to find some silver lining as a community to be able to move forward. And I feel like that that is the silver lining and that's why we made that film. Um, you know, uh, and I also think that, you know, like for, for the film, um, you know, it definitely is a much more Pan-Asian vision of, of, of our community. Um, and so, yeah, I think that those are the basic things, but, you know, I, I can't say anything about, you know, like that film. It's just, you know, such an iconic film. So, and it's hard to compare films as filmmakers. Do you know what I mean? But those yeah. are the things I would say. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Was there a second question? Yeah, this is a second question too. I really oh, okay. appreciate your answer just because like on films typically, like, you know, every film has a different perspective and with a documentary, like there's like a way like the storyteller creates documentaries. So I think that's really interesting. Mm -hmm. yeah, so for my second question, it's um, did looking at the event in a 25 year after retrospective help emphasize any of the lessons we should be taking from Vincent Chin's murder? Uh, let me see if I actually have the, because uh, your, your audio kept chopping in. Uh, let me see if I actually have it written down. Uh, did looking at the event in a help emphasize any of the lessons we should take away? Um, you mean comparing the two films? Um, it's been a while since I've seen that first film, so I don't know how much that film goes into coalition building. Um, you know, but I think that for me, one of the lessons that I think about uh, moving forward as a community is this notion of allyship versus being able to stand on our own. And I think it's an issue that we're still confronting as Asian Americans now, as we talk about the Black Lives Matter movement, right? Like in terms of how do we as Asian Americans situate ourselves in this? I mean, we obviously are, are the victims of discrimination in this country, both institutional and on a, you know, microaggression level. But at the same time, you know, I don't know if it's comparable to African Americans. So it's like a weird you know, um, situation, you know, in terms of how we sort of claim allyship or equalness in, in these things. Um, you know, so I think that 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 is something that I think about. Um, because on one hand, you know, when the Vincent Chin case was coming about, you have to remember that the Asian community or the, the, or the in Michigan was very, very small. Um, and they really had no experience in terms of any type of political mobilization or activism. I mean, it was an old community, like my family been in Michigan since the 1800s. So it's not like we hadn't been around, but it's just that we stuck with business, right? Or we were just taking care of a lot of stuff. And so when the Vincent Chin case 
happened, there was a steep learning curve, right? In terms of how to do things. And, you know, we had a lot of help from African Americans and Jewish Americans in terms of learning basic uh, activist things like you know, um, how to write a letter to the editor, how do you get a meeting with an elected official, how do you organize a protest? These are not things that were very common in our community, so nobody had that wealth of knowledge. But at the same time, you know, while these groups did give us the seeds of that, ultimately we had to run with it ourselves, right? Because we couldn't count on these other communities to do the heavy lifting. And I don't think, nor should we have expected them to do it. Do you know what I mean? Um, and so that makes me think about our current situation too, is like, you know, the importance of allyship, but the also the importance of being able to stand on your own and being able to define these agendas for your own and find commonality and, but also recognize when your issues are not necessarily a hundred percent the same as other communities, right? And where, where you can agree to disagree, you know, um, and accept the differences in, in understanding of your community's experiences because they're not 100% the same, right? So. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Caleb, or thank you, Felix. Um, next on the list will be Caleb. Hey, Caleb. Hey, Curtis. Hey. Uh, thanks for doing this. Uh, I just had a question about, um, do you see any parallels between the murder of Vincent Chin and uh, the recent murder of George Floyd? And also, um, I guess I wanted to, get your thoughts on how um, Americans have responded to these events since Vincent Chin all the way moving up to, to George Floyd. Okay, let me, I'll take the first question first and then I'll get to the second one because I'm not sure how that fits. But um, so the parallels between this and George Floyd, um, I was thinking about this and it's, it's really hard because there are, there are two aspects to this situation, right? One is the actual crime itself. Right. And so if you want to say what's a similar similarity between Vincent Chin and George Floyd, both is that they were attacked by, you know, um, white people who thought that they had a right to, uh, you know, treat a minority or a person of color in such a inhumane way. I mean, so on a very, very basic level, that's probably the similarity. Um, but I think the more interesting thing is talking about how the justice system uh, responds to these two cases, right? And that's the other way that you can compare it to. So in, in these two, I, I think it's a little too early to say how the Vincent Chin case is similar to the George Floyd case, because we really don't know how it's gonna go through the justice system yet. But I would say that one of the cases that I oftentimes would relate it to more similarly was the Trayvon Martin case, right? Because with that one, you already saw how that went through the justice system, right? In the sense of, you know, who was perceived as the victim in that case, right? Uh, the judges, they obviously sided with, you know, um, Zimmerman, you know, just as they sided with um, Evans and Nitz, right? They asked all kinds of stupid questions in the Trayvon Martin case about like, well, what was he doing out? Why was he wearing that hoodie, right? They asked the same type of stupid questions with Vincent Chin, like, what was he doing at a bar? You know, like, uh, what were they talking about? These things are not relevant, right? I mean, because there was a murder that happened here. Um, you know, how did they sweep it out under the rug? I mean, initially with the Trayvon Martin case, they really weren't pursuing anything. It was only because of public pressure, right? But with the Vincent Chin case, similarly, they didn't really pursue it until the community started demanding more answers, right? So I think that, so, so I think that a better comparison is looking at that one, only because it has wound its way through the court system a little bit uh, more so than the George Floyd case. I don't really know what the similarities are yeah. yet because we haven't seen it completely played out, but um, we at least know both, both of them were um, incidents where race probably had an impact, I would guess. So. Gotcha, yeah. And then your second question, I, I didn't quite understand it. What was it? Yeah, I guess uh, it was kind of, do you think uh, the community responses to like the murder of Vincent uh, Chin and George Floyd, do you think they've changed over time? Like the way that the community has actually responded to these events? You mean the Asian American community or the American community in general? Uh, I guess either. Uh, well, I think that the one thing that if you talk to a lot of longtime activists, I think one of the things that why they're so hopeful about the George Floyd protest is because they really see these as really multicultural things. And I wonder if that's a bunch of young people um, 
you know, being involved in it. And it's a generational thing um, where I think people your age, right? You guys are all college students, right? Yeah. Um, you guys grew up in the era of Obama and understanding these things, seeing the world slightly a little bit different and maybe disassociated a little bit more from that, that past, right? Um, I'll share a, a, a story. It's like, you know, when, when Vincent Hu first came out, right? It's 2009. That was right after Obama was elected. And um, I was touring around to different colleges and, um, you know, some t it, was, it was really interesting to sort of see the, the different reactions to the film, depending on what the audience was. Because sometimes I'd be invited by Asian American student clubs, but then sometimes I'd be invited to say a historically black college, right? Or a, a school that was like mandatory assignment for the entire university. So it'd be like 95% white audience, do you know what I mean? Responding back. And it's really, really kind of interesting, um, you know, the response I would get from the different communities. And um, one thing that I, one question that I got from a handful of white students was, um, you know, why do you have to make this film? Because we just elected a black president. I mean, we don't have racism in this country anymore, right? <laughs> and um, I was like, uh, do you hear the feedback things about the birther? That, that's kind of racism, right? But, yeah. um, you know, I, I do think that kids at that time in 2009 genuinely, genuinely wanted to believe that America had turned the page, that we'd gotten over this chapter, right? And I think that what we've seen in the last, God, what, it's been 12 years since then, is that maybe we haven't. Yes, we've made progress, but yet we still have a way to go. And I think that, that for, for students and people around that age, I think that has um, given them more impetus to, um, because they thought that our country had progressed, maybe there's a more of a drive from them to actually get to that place where they believed that they wanted to be in or where they felt the country was when they were shaping their ideas about these issues, right? Versus maybe, maybe older people like us who maybe didn't have as much delusions about that or maybe a different sense of it. And plus, I guess younger people are just more integrated, right? Like in terms of, um, you know, being around with people of different backgrounds and stuff like that. So, um, so I guess that, that those would be sort of the differences, right? And moving forward is that we, we've replaced a lot of older generations who don't have as a multicultural view of this country as with younger people who do, I think, fully embrace it, right? It isn't just a, um, it's a slogan. I do think that they, they, they want it more, maybe. I'm just guessing, so. Thanks, Curtis. Okay, asking the question next is Harry. Hi, uh, I have a question about what projects are you working now? Oh, okay. Um, well, <laughs> given the COVID thing, it's uh, not a lot, but no, actually I am. I'm getting a lot done. Um, so, uh, you know, the Vincent Chin thing and going back to Michigan actually um, got me working on a lot of different things. So um, I'm actually working on this memoir. Uh, that's where I spend most of my time. It's a book called Everything I Learned. I Learned in a Chinese Restaurant. And it's about growing up in that Chinese restaurant in Detroit and coming out um, you know, uh, so it deals with a lot of issues of class, sexual orientation, and race uh, in Detroit. Um, I, I've been working on it for a number of years. I haven't had much luck selling it, but I think that with this rise of all these discussions about race and stuff like that, I'm shifting the book a little bit more to talk about what's it like being an Asian American in a very, very black and white city, right? Because Detroit is, is iconically known as a very segregated uh, city like that. And so I'm working on that. Um, so I'm pretty excited. That's the thing that's exciting me right now. Um, and then I'm also working on this new documentary that Ma Maggie mentioned called Our Chinatown. And that was in production and it was looking at the challenges facing a lot of these Chinatowns around the United States because I grew up in the one in Detroit, but it's completely gone now. And I just really was wondering, like, is this going to be the fate of all Chinatowns in the United States? And so, you know, we covered a bunch of different cities, including San Francisco, uh, the school that's across from you guys, you know, um, we, we follow the principal there, uh, but we also, um, you know, have stories from New York, Boston, Chicago, all looking at a different facet of the challenge. And we were close to getting done. We were just filming the LA piece um, and then, you know, shutdown happened. And so uh, we're sort of in limbo right now. Um, I think what we will do is we'll shift it so that the film will actually now address the COVID aspect of it. 
And so if everything goes well, um, you know, we have to raise a little bit more money for it for the post-production. And we have maybe about two more days worth of filming. Um, you know, there's a new restaurant that's opening up in Chinatown that we're sort of covering as part of the story. You know, it's sort of, sort of uh, represent the rebirth of, of Chinatown that even despite all these challenges that there's always life and a new generation coming through Chinatown. Um, and so uh, they, we just filmed them um, with uh, their health, their final health department visit. So when they do the celebration opening, then we just have to film that and then that film will be done and we just have to edit it. So that's what I'm working on uh, now. So, and then I also do a lot of political stuff. So I'm helping out with the campaigns, you know, trying to get a new president, so. Thank you. Um, the next question comes from Vem Chung. I'm trying to look on the map where this face is going to pop up. Okay. <laughs> I don't know whether you remember us or not. My uh, wife is Marissa. Oh, hey. How are you doing? Hi. Hey. You was the VP of uh, ACJ, one of the founders. Yeah. And now you guys are out there. We're, we're in the uh, Bay Area. We live in the, uh, Berkeley. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Yeah. My mom moved out there. Oh, yeah. You, so my whole family's out in the Bay Area now. There's a lot of ex-Michiganders out there. Yes. You, you bring a lot of memories back to us. Yes. Yeah. We're, oh. just wondering, yeah. we're just wondering, what, what happened to the two killers? Yes. And this. Where are they? Do you know? Uh, yeah. The... Um, the stepson, um, he, I think, moved back to Wisconsin. But the father, the guy who actually swung the bat, um, he's actually in uh, Nevada. And everybody, just to show you how much he's gotten away with this murder, is that even if you just wanted to Google, you could easily find out where he lives. I mean, he hasn't, he's, you know, he's lived an open life in that way. And I know that some Asian Americans, led by Corky Lee, the photographer from New York, has tried to put pressure on him to, um, you know, pay up because he still owes money to the family, right? Um, he, I think he paid his first um, check, I think, out of the settlement that, that they'd reached, but he never paid anything after that. And so he just moved to Nevada, the state with the, the most lax laws in terms of, um, you know, recovering um, uh, settlements and stuff like that, or, or uh, uh, what do they call it? Um, judgments from, from the court. Uh, and so he's moved and he's lived there um, the rest of his life. And so I know that they, they try to like put pressure on him. And so, you know, they, that Corky goes and he leads a group of people and they'll like knock on his door and tell his neighbors who he is and remind him. So he's trying to put pressure on him. But um, at this point, there's really not much else you can do except just to get him to pay back, you know, to pay, pay up some of this money. But, um, you know, there's not much else you can do. So, yeah. but if you want his address, Google it. I'm sure you'll find it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know Helen Zia actually is the executor of Mrs. Chin's uh, estate. And, yeah, uh, do you guys see her? She lives out in Oakland. Yeah, yeah, we saw her once in a while. Oh, yeah. okay, good, good, yeah. yeah. She just published a new book. Yes, on, on the Shanghai. Yeah, Last Bow Out of Shanghai, something like yeah. that. Yeah. And I think she's doing another, she's doing a Zoom session, a webinar, maybe even today with the Chinese Museum down here in, San, uh, in LA. I think she's doing an event too. So she's still definitely involved in it. And if you guys uh, haven't heard, there's actually a, a book coming out um, from Norton um, that, our, that my friend um, Paula Yu, uh, who just wrote, it's coming out next year. It's geared for young adults. Um, so uh, it's going to be a very important book. She's, she got access to so many people um, through it. She's a former journalist who used to write for the Detroit News. Um, and so she has a book coming out. So you should look for that. What is the book's title? I think it's called, and I don't know if I really like the title, but it's called From a Whisper to a Rallying Cry or something. It was just announced like within the last two days or three days. But it's geared towards young adults. But she had access to everybody. I mean, she talked to, I think she talked to Vicky. I think she talked to like, you know, family members. It was like, she actually went and she went to Vegas and met up with the guy too. 
the, da- the the killer. I mean, so she she brought her journalistic skills to it. So um, you should look out for that book. Yeah. Uh-huh. What's the author's name again? Uh, Paula Yu, Y O O. And the publisher is Norton. And I think you can pre order it now. Um, Paula's Korean American. Um, you know, uh, and she talks about how the case really impacted her. Paula. 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 Yeah. So, Paula. Okay. So, so good to see you again. Curtis. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. You know, and let's stay in touch somehow. I mean, I'm in the Bay Area a lot. So, maybe at another Chinese Historical Society event or something. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Yep. Thank you. And then um, our volunteer, Serena, also shared the link for the book in the chat room if you guys want to um, click on that. Oh, okay. Find Great. It later. Thank you, Serena. Uh, our next question comes from Anna. And after Anna will be Derek has a comment or, uh, that he wants to make. Hi, Curtis. Hi, Anna. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. So early in the film, um, one of the students responds to the interviewer, something along the lines of, that happened before I was born. So I guess, how would you describe to the youth the importance of being aware of historical events like these? Uh, Well, I guess that's a general comment, right? Not just about the Vincent Chin case, but all history, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that part of that's the school's responsibility to, to do more emphasis on ethnic studies and integrating the stories of people of color into the curriculum. Um... And I, I don't know, I mean, are young people generally interested in history? I mean, like maybe it has to be framed in a certain way. Maybe they just like retro stuff. <laughs> I, don't really, I don't really know. I mean, you know, I always get surprised when I see these things. Oh, you know, young kids know about this thing, right? Um, so I don't know how you make history cool. I don't know how you make civil rights cool. I don't know how you make social justice cool. Um, you know, I think it's cool, but, uh, you know, I know that not every kid wants to be bothered with this kind of stuff. But I think that if you tie it into, um, you know, issues that they're dealing with now and things that may have happened to their own personal life, then maybe it's easier for them to get it. Um, as for the Vincent Chin case itself, I understand why um, a lot of, um, you know, people who call themselves Asian American, you know, these days um, may not know the case. I mean, because if you think about it, in 1982, the majority of Asian Americans um, were either weren't in this country yet because they're immigrants or they weren't born yet, right? And so maybe that, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, tends towards the um, disconnect. But I think once you start talking about the case and the particulars of the case, people immediately connect it, right? They immediately say, oh, I get it. You know what I mean? Oh, he confused the Chinese for Japanese. Oh, that happens all the time. Oh, you know what I mean? He said he took my job, you know, or, you know, da da da. You, once you start getting into those very particular details, I think that connects it with people, and they really they get it because they connect it to something that's happened in their life or something that's happened to you know similar, you know, uh, to to somebody in their life. And so I, maybe that's the way, right? Because you know people need a vested interest in it. I think. Mm-hmm. So. Thank you. Mm-hmm. All right. Thank you, Anna. Um, and next is Derek. It's like a puzzle. It's like, you know, whose face is going to pop up next? Who's behind door Hi. number? Hi, Curtis. Hi, Derek. Hi. Um, I, I just um, made a comment, and I, I guess uh, the host thought, uh, Maggie <laughs> thought it might be good to share the comment. Um, early, I think one of the earlier questions uh, was with regard to um, the... Uh, civil rights movement and and whether um, uh, there were others aside from Vincent Chin and what came to mind was um, Chul Su Li. Um, and although Chul Su Li was not Chinese, he was actually Korean. Uh, he was involved in a Chinatown uh, gang shooting, misidentified and convicted. Um, that happened during the early uh, 70s, I think. But his trial, um, due to a lot of um, organizing and advocacy by a wide range of uh, Asian Americans, um, happened around, uh, I think it was around the late 70s. 
um, K.W. Lee, a noted uh, Korean uh, American journalist um, who's in his, I think he's in his 90s now. Uh, but anyways, uh, he, uh, he did a story based on advocacy and uh, it, it spurred a lot of folks to get together. And the long and the short of it is there was a five or six year um, legal battle. A lot of money had to be raised, a, a lot of uh, uh, legal process uh, had to uh, be done. And um, in the end, there was a plea deal. It's a very complicated case, but there was a plea deal and he was set free. But the upshot is uh, in terms of, in my view, of if you're looking at, um, you know, um, civil rights causes, and this was happening around the same time as, as Vincent Chin, that's why it, it spurred uh, my memory. And similarities are that, you know, there was a wide range of um, Asian Americans as well as Asians, not just across the United States, but also internationally. Uh, so I just wanted to um, alert folks to that and hopefully others have heard about the case or might be interested and look further into that case uh, because I, I think it, it had a lot of significance for. And another example of Asian Americans uh, rising up and organizing and advocating and fighting. Yeah, thank you for that comment. I mean, I, I obviously know about the case and I've, I've, I've heard about it. Um, I think it happened a little bit before Vincent, if I'm not correct, um, if I'm not wrong. Um, but I think that, that maybe one of the reasons why the Vincent Chin case actually became m bigger in some ways, right, or went mainstream, was because the Vincent Chin case actually had a connection. And this is sort of related to what Anna was saying about asking about history and, you know, like how you connect things is that, you know, with the Vincent Chin case, you know, it wasn't just like something that happened in Chinatown, right? It was something that affected all the people in Detroit. They had a stake in it. They had a vantage point because it was literally about, you know, the American automobile industry, right? The, the story, it had a, a hook. It was connected to the larger narrative of what was happening in Detroit at that time, which was, you know, people were losing their jobs, da, 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 da. So that even if you didn't give a damn about an Asian American getting murdered, you gave a damn about what was happening you know, to the auto industry. You gave a damn about what was happening to the auto worker or this perception that the Japanese automobile makers were taking over, right? And so I think because of that, people had a opinion, you know, uh, uh, of it. Whereas, you know, for like the Chosu Lee case, a lot of people didn't care. They didn't care. They, they, they weren't connected to it because they're, in a lot of ways, people are selfishly motivated. They're connected, right? Until, unless they know what's in it for them, right? like what this case is connected to. So I, I think that that's, you know, and plus I also think that with the Vincent Chin case, you can't underestimate the importance of Lily Chin, you know, going out there and speaking as a mother and her being a very, very articulate spokesperson and very sympathetic figure, um, which rallied a lot of people to to um, be interested in the case. I don't know if that happened with Cho Su Lee. I don't know who, who were the spokespeople. I'm just trying to identify, well, why did the Vincent Chin case really take off? What, are, what, are the, what were the ingredients that made that case really stand out? And so those are just some of the things I, I think about, um, you know, but yes, you're right. There are definitely so many other cases out there that we could easily talk about, that we could be pointing out, you know, that we should be remembering, um, you know, and I definitely think we should, right? And hopefully there are filmmakers out there that want to go back and reclaim some of this history and cover the things that are going on now um, because there definitely are a lot of these unfortunately there are definitely a lots of these stories out there that that could be told and that are worthy of a movie I think yeah and that's why folks like you are so important and I am aware of someone who is who has been working on a film oh great uh, and I don't know if it's done yet but uh, there's a couple of folks uh, down in Southern California who are working on a film and and hopefully it will be uh, completed and coming out soon. As you know, I mean, anytime you do these films, because they're independent films, right? There's very little support and, you know, we struggle. And so, you know, we always take longer than we want to make these films, unfortunately. So, um, you know, good luck to those people and hopefully that film can come out because, yeah, I definitely think that it would be something that would have a lot of interest, I think. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm.
Awesome. Um, I don't think there's any more questions at the moment. So if you do have more questions, message Serena quick. But there's been a few comments that were shared to me, um, Curtis, that I wanted to convey um, from one of the CHSA staff members, Paul McGee. Is it about my hair? No, I don't think any, no one's told me about your hair. So that <laughs> I am innocent. Sorry. Um, or my hair either. So um, yeah, but um, one of our staff members wanted to say thank you for making such a powerful film and acknowledge how much Asian Americans have also learned from other organizations. So thank you for that. And another one of our interns who wasn't able to join the program today also had a comment that I thought was very fitting for kind of ending this conversation. Um, he is um, originally from China, but went to school at San Francisco State University. And he did say that it wasn't his first time learning about Vincent Chin, and he remembers about learning about Vincent Chin in his Asian American history class. Um, he said he doesn't remember much from the class, but he remembers that Vincent Chin's death was a hate crime and that, you know, what stuck out to him was before Vincent died, he said, like, it is unfair. Um, so in, our, our intern, Tony, um, he had some questions about, like, as an Asian American young person, how can we look to our friends and family for help? And, you know, how can we do something to prevent this unfair thing from happening in our community? Well, uh, first, you're going to elect a new president, um, someone who's not going to uh, stoke uh, you know, racism against Asians. Uh, that's something we can all get involved in because part of it is leadership, right? It's, it's like, who are the people? There, we all know that there's a lot of discrimination and racism out there, but part of it is like, what are the community leaders doing, right? And what, how are they standing up against this? Relating this back to the Vincent Chin case, one of the problems that we as a community faced was that there was not unanimous support for the Asian American community in Detroit at that time, particularly amongst the elected officials and the uh, business leaders, right? Because they all sided with the white auto worker. You did not have politicians coming out and condemning, you know, Ebens and Nitz, right? Because they did not want to be perceived as going against these two people, right? There's no, there was no political benefit for them to do that, right? And so I think that that's why you need to elect and highlight, you know, leaders, whether they be politicians or business leaders or celebrities, you know, who you support, who, who want to, um, you know, create an environment where everybody can thrive, where there isn't racism and discrimination and things like that. Um, you know, in terms of a, uh, I guess, smaller level, like what can we do to, to help people? Um, well, I guess that's the first is like create a better environment so these things don't happen so that people know that, you know, when they do these things that, that it's wrong, it will not be accepted. I think part of the reason why you have seen a spike in hate crimes against Asian Americans is directly related to the fact that the current occupant of the White House does not, you know, stand up against white supremacy, right? And, and as long as he does that, that makes all communities of color vulnerable. And he knows that, and yet he continues to do it. And in fact, he stokes it. And so, you know, um, making sure that people know, so it's not like, so it's not like all these white supremacists were created by Trump, right? But I think that they were given permission to act on their um, beliefs because of Trump. Right. And so what we have to do is we have to stand up against that and say this is wrong so that those people don't stand up and they don't act out on their things. And hopefully eventually, you know, um, you know, it'll 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 die out. It won't be as common, I guess. Um, and then on, a, on, a, on after you've created the environment, if unfortunately a hate crime or something bad happens, what is the community's response to it? What are the services out there, right? Do they know that they will be supported and believed? You know, I mean, in some ways that's related to the Me Too movement, right? Like in terms of, you know, when victims, you know, feel the strength to sort of come out and call things out, right? I think that's a big part of it now is that, you know, we as people of color know that we've suffered discrimination, sometimes really blatant, sometimes subconscious, you know, or, or subtle or whatever. But now that we are feeling more empowered to come out and speak out, whether it's because there's now video that's available or whether because we sense that there's an army of people out there, whether it's a K-pop army <laughs> or whatever, who will back you up, you know what I mean, and, and call out these things. I think that that, that makes people feel more confident and we, I, we, we see the extent that these um, things are happening. And I think that that, um, that helps it too.
right? Um, uh, it makes people feel more confident to sort of stand up. And as we feel more confident to stand up, then those other people, once again, feel less confident to sort of s step up and act out about it. There was actually just this video that I was watching early this morning about this uh, woman who, um, you know, what they call a Karen, I guess, uh, you know, um, uh, there's an African American driver who, you know, um, said that, you know, she called him the N word and uh, he started videotaping her. And as soon as she start, he started videotaping her, you see the panic in her saying, no, 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 don't ruin my life, da, 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 da. You know what I mean? So hopefully that gets other people to start thinking like, well, I better not use that N word or I could be the next, you know, viral video and I could, you know, lose my job. You know, it's too bad that they still feel that way, right? Because that is the ultimate goal is to get people not to hate one another. But if you could at least stop them from acting out on that hate, I think that maybe that's, you know, the best we can do with some people, right? You may not be able to change their minds, you know, about these things, but, you know, don't allow them to act on it. And so I think that with these videos that people are doing now, <clears throat> you know, some people have said, oh, it's overkill. Oh, you just want to, you know, become famous or whatever by videotaping these things. But no, I mean, it is helping, right? And if it gets people to stop doing it because they know that they could potentially lose their job, et cetera, et cetera, then, then by all means continue filming, I think, so. No, I think that's exactly, that's a good point to make, you know, is being able to document stuff and also like the, what we can do, at, you know, the first step is getting people in office and people in leadership who are going to display the kind of leadership that we want in our country. So, um, yeah. You yeah, yeah, we want, yeah. we want, what is the vision that we have for this country, right? And we are at a, at a really, a juncture, Right. I, I feel like maybe this is something we've dealt with throughout our whole history. Right. Because people's, you know, I, I have these arguments with these people on the right. You know what I mean? And they always blame Obama. Right. And they say, oh, this is all Obama's fault. You know what I mean? He created these racial problems in this country. I think it's bullshit. I mean, I mean, did you not know that we had a giant civil war about this? <laughs> we've had this problem, you know, and what we, the way we treated the Native Americans, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, you know, we've had racial problems in this country. I think the key thing about Obama's and where you could, um, you know, assign him some responsibility for his, this or his victory is that once Obama ascended to the highest office in this country, literally the highest position in this world in some ways, right? I think that really for a lot of people, you know, a lot of racists, you know, white racists, I think it, you know, it just cemented in this idea that, oh my God, there's no turning back, right? Like this is, you know, uh, at least there's always this notion that, you know, we'd always have a white male president, but now that we didn't have one, you know, it, it was very threatening to them and therefore they started acting out on it. I think so, yes, Obama's presidency triggered that fear in them, you know, that they were gonna be forever cut out, that they would not have a seat at the table and stuff like that. But, you know, the irony is that I, I, I think that Obama actually bent over backwards, you know, to create a seat at the table for a lot of people, even people who didn't frankly deserve it, you know? Yeah. Um, and so uh, I think that, that Obama's presidency did, did, you know, do it, but it's not, he didn't start the race stuff the way that they think that they, that That's he portrayed, did. yeah. Or at least what's in their mind, right? Like they think that Obama stoked the race, you know, war in this country or whatever. But no, the race war has been going on since the founding, you know, <laughs> ask the Native Americans, you know, about the race war that's been going on nonstop, you know, I mean, so, yeah. Okay, well, thank you, Curtis, again, for joining us. And thank you, everyone, for asking questions um, and for bearing with some of the tech issues. I'm glad that we were all able to make it through um, that little moment of panic, at my end, at least. So, again, thank you. Um, and you guys can look me up on Facebook too if you want. Staying in touch with the conversation with my next film too. So you can just look me up, Curtis Chin. I'll promise to accept your friend's request. Okay, and will that actually be you or the other Curtis Chin? <laughs> yeah, you guys have to be careful. There's a Curtis Curtis S Chin, I believe. He's a Republican, you know, uh, who's uh, was a Bush appointee. But I think that you you can tell <laughs> by yeah, the so post. You know what Curtis looks like now. Um, yeah. yeah, you can find him on Facebook. If you do have further questions, you kind of want to yeah. continue on this conversation or ask him more about um, 
you know, the projects he's working on. And yeah. also, if you haven't had a chance to watch um, Vincent Hu yet, you can go to vincenthumovie.com and find the documentary there. Curtis has been great in offering it free to people. Um, so that is, you know, a luxury that we have that we're able to watch videos for free to, you know, continue educating ourselves. So uh, thank you everyone again for joining and thank you, Curtis. Yep. Thank you for inviting me. Have a great afternoon. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.